the conversation and then we'll get started. I see, wow, more, more than 250 of you so far. So I'm excited to um, start the conversation. Hopefully a lot of what we'll discuss today will prove, if not um, immediately useful to you, hopefully motivating. Um, so we'll be getting started in a few seconds waiting for it to stabilize and then all right let's get started all right so afternoon evening and morning as your time zone time zone suggests everybody my name is Uche Mechi. I teach about leadership and entrepreneurship here at the Harvard Graduate School of, Age, of Education or HGSC or HUGZ as we so affectionately call it welcome to education now this is your first education now Education Now is a webinar series that we designed to respond to the dramatic shifts in education and the education field and sector in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. So in today's conversation, we're gonna discuss the continued anxiety that students and teachers alike are feeling, look at perhaps how to make classrooms a safe and welcoming space for those experiences, and also consider how we can teach, lead, coach, and mentor with compassion. Today's episode is being recorded. It will be available to view on Harvard Education's YouTube and Facebook pages. And you can also visit hgsc.me forward slash ed now for recordings and information about future episodes. You can also submit your questions using the Q and A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, you'll also find closed caption access there. All right, so let's get started. I, I am joined today by two of my faculty colleagues and two of my new friends in the education field. So first we've got Rhonda Bondi. Rhonda teaches about teaching special education and teacher leadership at HGSC. She's focused her career on ensuring that all learners are valued, engaged and stretched in inclusive classrooms. We'll touch on her teacher decision-making framework for inclusive instructional practices during today's conversation. Nice to have you, Rhonda. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we've got Victor Pereira Jr. Victor is a master teacher in residence um, of the Harvard Teacher Fellows Program. And Victor also leads HGSE's new master's program in teaching and teacher leadership. As you know, we've reorganized our programming. Looking forward to seeing um, Victor. He'll talk a bit today about his workshop on instructional challenges and solution. Hey, Victor, how you doing? Doing well, thank you, Uche. <laughs> Excellent. And then now my two new friends that I just met last week were already like besties already. So we've got Ed Yu. Ed is a bio biology teacher at Codman Academy. Codman Academy is a public charter school here in the Boston area. Ed is also a valued mentor to teachers in training, and he's also an alum of HGSC, Hugsies Teacher Education Program. Hey, Ed, how you doing? Good, great to be here. Welcome. And last but not least, we've got Kalia Hopkins. Kalia is a special education administrator in New York City's Department of Education and works as a coach and mentor to special education teachers and administrators. Welcome, Kalia. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Excellent. All right, brilliant. So we're going to jump into some questions. Now, the way we're going to run this, I'm going to have a few questions prepared for either some or all of the participants, but we'll also, as I mentioned earlier, take some Q&A from you, and we will try our best to either take those questions directly or just try to address the questions um, organically through the conversation. So first, I want to, I want to ask you a question, Rhonda. So and then, of course, Ed, Kalia, you can jump in. Um, Victor, you can jump in, too. You don't have to just stand in the corner. <laughs> so the phrase learning loss is something that I've, I've heard, of course, in the past, but it's something that's kind of been bubbling up more in the last 18 months and definitely this school year. And I think a part of it is in response as people try to, I don't know, maybe term what they feel has been the impact on education of the last 18 months in the pandemic and the hybrid and online learning. As I think about that word, I feel like there's, I don't know, there's something wrong with it. There's a deficit perspective to it. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that, Rhonda? Yeah, I think um, it's a media message that we as educators need to disrupt. 
because words lead to our thoughts, lead to our actions. And so the words matter and how we frame student learning matters. Um, I would invite you to reframe every day and in every conversation and really work as a community to disrupt that message. Focusing on the experiences that students have had, the learning gains they've had, and assuming that when students come to a task, they absolutely are bringing a rich experience that we're building on. And so our first strategy that I would give to you as part of disrupting that message is the very first thing we need to do uh, in, when we launch every lesson is look for what students are bringing. Look and listen with uh, great intention, lift up what we're noticing and learning from students. And I think that's a great strategy for beginning to reframe and disrupt that message. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. I love that. Really focusing on what are people bringing and not assuming that it's just about what people have lost. Ed, Kalia, anything you'd like to add? Ed, you go first. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I really agree with Rhonda saying that that deficit model is, I think, damaging to students to think about what they can't do. Um, one thing that I think is important is that we have an entire generation of students that are very technologically savvy. They can navigate Google Docs, Google Classroom, um, being able to watch a video screen, use the chat. And so those are things that we have very good practice on that we can leverage in the classroom. So I think that's a really good opportunity to thinking about like switching from like the paper and pencil to thinking about how to like leverage that technology skill. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was thinking also, um, Uchi, to your point about being just triggered by the word learning loss. And also, this is not new language. This is definitely um, a reiteration of like the achievement gap and all of these other words that we've heard before. And I think one of the things that I've had some struggles with is really not looking internally at how we re frame our values, because there's a gap and a loss because of the fact that we don't have our values aligned appropriately, at least in my opinion, right? So if we're saying that it's only about academics, when we've also seen so many of our students really come together and help one another out in this during this pandemic, checking in with, with one another, um, and this goes back to like the whole point of this, this webinar, which is around compassion. We've seen so much of our students coming through for their teachers actually, right? Like helping their teachers navigate the technology, helping their teachers um, understand like what's going on with them behind the scenes, why their cameras are off, having these very candid conversations. And I think we don't put enough value on that, those soft, what, the, what people consider soft skills, which I wouldn't actually say is soft. I would think they're very valuable skills. But um, I think that's where we're having a disconnect um, is between what we say we value versus what actually, what we leverage and what we, what we measure in classrooms. Hmm. Thank you, Kalia. I love this kind of thread of conversation. So focus on the, on the assets. And they we're talking about, okay, so let's not just look at deficits, so look at assets. And some of the assets that I'm hearing are what the students are bringing, whether it be specific skills or these kind of like emotional supports and being resources, not just for themselves, but also perhaps for their teachers. And kind of on that topic, Victor, I'd like to turn that turn this to you. So Kalia, you mentioned compassion and students being supportive and of each other and perhaps their teachers. Can you talk a little bit about what it looks like from the teacher's perspective, perhaps this idea of teaching with compassion or engaging students? Absolutely. Um, and another point that I want to highlight, you know, thinking about what does it mean to teach or lead with compassion is something uh, Kalia said in terms of understanding our students. We don't always know the other person's story. What looks like a disruptive behavior might be a call for help or unclear expectations. What looks like a disengaged student might be that a student is hungry or tired. What looks mm -hmm. like a student that is not trying or not interested in class might be a student that loves a subject but doesn't know how to ask for help. So teaching with compassion means understanding other stories, um, you know, the people that we work with, um, including taking time to know yourself. This means building relationships with students, parents, and community. This includes checking our own assumptions and biases and leading with inquiry. Taking the opportunity to ask questions and listen, listening helps us act with empathy. But one important piece that I always like to share with my teachers, don't take it personal, but take it as your personal responsibility to understand the ways you can make students develop confidence and comfort in their space. Each student needs their person, an advocate in their community um, and that helps them understand their position in the learning. The amount of time building relationships and getting to know your students will pay dividends in the long run, not learning loss. 
there's just so many pearls of wisdom there. I'm really stuck on that one phrase. Nice turn of phrase there. Don't take it personally. Take it as your personal responsibility. I love that. That is great. Very thoughtful. And I would love to hear perhaps Ed and Kalia what you're seeing either in the schools from the students' perspective or from the teacher's perspective from this, this way of thinking in terms of teaching with compassion, looking for the assets that are there and really understanding. So maybe Kali, you can go first if you have anything to say. Okay, yes, tag me in. Um, so I teach by the case study method. I'm used to just calling people, cold calling. So you're it, ready. It's never cold because I'm ready. You know? Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Um, so it was interesting because I was actually Googling the word compassion to see how it showed up in the dictionary and um, online. And one of the things that was a little bit um, disturbing for me was this idea of like sympathetic pity was the first word that came up. And one of the things that I really have tried to, um, even in my own teaching, is never pity my students, um, never pity the adult learners that I'm working with. I think it's important that we acknowledge loss, but we don't center it. Right. And so I think there's a part of me that really wants to center the joy that we bring by being in community, by coming into classrooms together, by sharing the information that we've learned, not only in terms of information like content, but like what we're learning about one another, to your point, Victor. Right. And so just understanding one another and creating that space. One of the things that comes up a lot of the times is time. Right. I don't have the time to put all of this work into knowing my students. I have to get my content taught, right? But when you, what I've learned is that the more time we put into laying that foundational work, building those relationships, you don't have to press students to do their homework. You don't have to force them to engage. You don't, they're already bought in. So I think those are some of the ways that you, when you're leading with compassion, when you're teaching with this idea of like, we're in this together, then it, it really becomes a lot more of a seamless um, and communal activity. Learning becomes more communal and not obligatory. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ed, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I think um, for me, what was striking was that there were students that um, I'd known just talking to the middle school teachers of students that typically don't have not had success academically, um, but they very much thrived in the remote learning environment. And I was trying to think about like, why that happened. And um, one I saw for myself when I was remote teaching, seeing my son who's eight years old, needing to move around, needing to make noise, um, but still engaging in the lesson. So he, um, and so, um, that part where like those students are not trying to disrupt the classroom. That's not the intent, but what they need is that space to be able to move around, make noise. Um, but on Zoom, they could just mute and take care of those needs and still fully engage. And so um, that really changed how my, what I think a classroom should look and sound like. Um, and so I, this year I went about, I bought wobble boards, powerlifting, exercising, manipulatives, um, you name it. These are things that I knew were good, but I just, I was like, I was a little bit skeptical, but now I know that um, I allow kids to make those choices. They don't have to sit in their assigned seat. They just need to like hover around the table and like take care of whatever they need. Um, and so now I, th I think my class is more joyful. It's more productive. Um, and it's just, I had to make a shift of what my class needed to look and sound like. And I think it, it meets the needs of those students that um, in the Zoom environment um, found success. And so trying to recreate some of the, that freedom in my classroom has been really good. Um, Thank you, Ed. Thank you. So I, I, I'm like a verbal processor, so I'm trying to make my thinking visible, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going through kind of what I heard. Again, another pearl of wisdom from Kalia, acknowledge the loss, but don't center, don't it. center it. So we're not saying like there is no such thing as like learning loss, but we're saying it's not the defining character. I love that. Um, and then with Ed, like I'm hearing about just all of these innovations, these ideas that are coming, not just from like the teachers, but like from the students and or from watching the students really understanding how they're learning. And I think that's powerful, especially in the time of like crisis where maybe our tendency is to want to take control and just do things our way, but to actually, actually step back and listen and see what the kids are doing and then respond, not just react, but respond. So in that theme of innovation, Rhonda, I want to come back to you to get maybe some thoughts that you had around um, either things that from your research that you've seen around innovating in response to the experience and what we've learned last year. Mm -hmm. I have um, two strategies for everyone. Um, one is oftentimes when Kali was talking about 
um, relationships with students and getting to know students. That kind of happens um, in homeroom or in the hallway or before or after class. And then we like get into class. And mm -hmm. what I would invite you to do is to think about getting to know students throughout the whole experience of the day. And uh, so how are, what are students bringing about themselves to the content that we're teaching? Um, and it does two things for you. One, I think we have to acknowledge how exhausted we are. Uh, teachers have mm -hmm. bared such burden during the uh, pandemic from teaching hybrid, one, the uncertainty of going back and forth from in-person to online. And, um, have really gone uh, to great lengths to engage their students visiting homes, delivering technology. And I just want to really acknowledge the exhaustion. And one way, um, I'm a retired teacher, I, I taught for decades. And, and one way that I in, just find my passion and rejuvenate myself is remembering that I'm learning too and being a learner and really just experiencing the feel of learning while I'm teaching. So I would like you to bring these two ideas together, learning about students as your own learning and something that's super exciting for you and uh, you know makes the hair on your arm stand up. You're so excited. So instead of just circulating to make sure students are on task, for example, circulate to see what you can find out about the students. Um, what can you learn? Not only what they uh, are, are understanding from what you've taught, but what are they bringing? How are they connecting it with what they've known before, their lives, their future selves? Um, so to make a, a learning goal for yourself in every lesson. So you have the learning goal for the students, but what are you going to learn? Um, what can you learn about the content from your students and the strategies and the connections that they make? But what can you learn about each individual student? And I find that when I kick off with that idea of my own learning, it's extremely rejuvenating. So. I hope that that's a good strategy for you. Um, the second strategy I had was just thinking about, I think before COVID, we would typically see about a five-year academic range for any given task of students. And Kalia, you can jump in. Kalia and I have been talking about teaching to the middle is now over. The range of diversity of of what students are bringing to the task, both their strengths and incredible experiences, as well as some significant learning needs or um, needs for greater challenge are, are huge for teachers right now. Often um, some of the teachers that I was working with last weekend had kids ranging from third grade all the way through 11th grade in an independent reading level. Um, so I, I think like really that's the thing from the past that we can give up is teaching to the middle or teaching to the average, but really looking in every single task for the widest range of engagement and challenge that um, our lessons and our tasks and our learning opportunities afford for the students every day. Thank you for that, Rhonda. Before I go on, because I think I want to get perhaps at least Victor's perspective and definitely Ed and Kalia, I see a question in the chat that I think speaks right to a general theme that we've had today in your first response, Rhonda. So, Ricky Seif writes, is there a compassion fatigue that teachers are experiencing after a year of such personal loss? Can you be compassionate when you are completely drained and stressed? So um, I'm, I'm asking you the question, Rhonda, but I think this is, applies to everybody and I'm sure mm -hmm. everybody has their own experiences in addition to what learnings they wanna bring to bear. Mm -hmm. well, I think number one, you have to take care of yourself. Um, you, you know, first. So for one, care for yourself. But for two, um, like I just said, like if you focus on your own learning, when we're learning, um, our body doesn't experience pain the way it does when we're not learning. So like if you can find what you're learning, I think it will bring energy and rejuvenation to you. And the other thing too, I would say is remember uh, the greatest resource in the classroom is the students themselves. So we want to prompt self-regulated learning. We know it will lead to more effective learning, uh, more lasting learning, and ultimately the student agency that we want to um, promote in students for the rest of their life, right? For lifelong learning so that they feel agency in guiding and directing their own learning. So I think sometimes 
when I'm feeling tired or I'm feeling like I'm carrying 27 people on my, well, along with her dragging 27 people, I stop myself and think about, do the students think about self-regulated learning? Do the students understand the goal? Do they have a relationship with the goal? Is it, is it sensible to them? Have I afforded the students a way to monitor their own learning? Um, do they have help resources that they can access independently without me? Um, and, and I really try to stop, literally I stop and stand still and I stop circulating and prompt the students and I try not to move again until 100% of the students are engaged in the task. They don't have to be doing it correctly, they don't have to finish, but they're started. Um, and I think that that's an important thing to remember is that they're an incredible resource um, that we can uh, use to promote uh, learning in the classroom. Thank you. Victor, do you have any thoughts on either that specific question or just specific um, innovations in general? Yeah, so uh, Uji, I was thinking about some of the strategies um, that you know, I've worked with new teachers and both connecting uh, to you know, Rhonda's launch in terms of uh, reframing and both uh, Kalia's and Ed's you know, examples. Um, I think first we have to think about supporting students instead of you know, leading with their needs and deficits, shift the focus to their strengths, interests, and passions. Students wanna understand their perspectives as valued and how they can contribute to the learning in the community. Uh, next, I also want us thinking about um, you know, how we can improve our practice every day. Naming challenges helps us grow as professionals and, and position us to see the opportunities to be better for our students. Asking the right questions about what is happening in our classroom positions us to engineer the right solutions. Let us not forget the impact of collaboratively working towards a solution with our students. And then this may be addressing that same question. Uh, when we act, give ourselves act, time to act in a calculated, calm, and compassionate way. I suggest to new teachers and experienced teachers alike, pause and recite your mantra. My mantra that centers me and prepares me to act is that I know all students want to be successful. This helps me shift the focus from my emotions to my charge and pushes me to act in a way that help me, helps me meet this goal. Thank you. Ed or Kalia, anything you'd like to add? So yeah, when it comes down, to, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so when it comes down to the conversation about self-care, um, it's so crazy that we're having this conversation because I was actually just looking at a couple of tweets um, about self-care and kind of how that has become a little bit toxic um, in saying that word constantly. So one of the things that I tell um, the, the teachers that I work with is that you have to ask for help, right? Self-care is also about asking for help and delegating and knowing when you can't do certain things. Um, as much as you wanna look like the head person in charge and you're in the front of the room or in the front of the Zoom or whatever you, wherever you are, you cannot do, you can't, sometimes the lift really is too heavy. And so you do have to understand that you have 30 brilliant minds in front of you and put some of that cognitive load onto your students with this sense of not pushing them too much either because we're all experiencing these things albeit very differently, but together. Um, the one thing that I wanted to lift also is this, this idea of self-care in service of going back to be productive. And I don't think that that's always the answer, right? I'm not resting so that I can go wake up and start doing something again, right? And start working really, really hard again. Like that's not, that's not healthy. And I think it's not really self-care if the end game is still to go out there and, 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 and drive yourself crazy. Um, and I think the last thing about that self-care piece, and someone tweeted, um, so her name is Dr. Tracy Renee. She says, one day soon, we're going to have a conversation about how the term self-care is currently being weaponized against teachers. No amount of yoga or massages will fix this. <laughs> Educators are operating in full crisis mode and need structural changes from the top. And I just thought that was like super brilliant, right? Like <laughs> you can't, you can't, you know, do one of these things and levitate your way out of, you know, what's happening around you. And I think that um, coming to the, you know, coming to grips with the fact that we, the, you're asking a lot of teachers right now. And I think stopping and saying, hey, this is what I am able to do that, you, that I can do well is a part of self-care too, right? I can do this well and no more. After that, you're not going to get my best self. You're not going to get my best work and my students will suffer as a result of it. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, um, 
That's only one of the matters that I think what's helped with reframing of how I do classroom management or like redirecting students, which I think is like a very practical thing that happens for the, uh, the classroom teachers is like asking the student, like, what do you need? Like, what, like, what do you need? What can I help? What can I help you with? And so like, rather than thinking like a student is tapping the desk just to be annoying, it's like, do they need, like, what supports do they need in place to, like, um, to re-engage in the lesson? They can be tired. They can be hungry. They, there could be like um, economic instability at home, which is causing all this kind of internal stress that's acting out in the classroom. And so like figuring that out, having those like check-ins and conversations with our students, I think that's really important to like build that compassion. So like seeing what you in the classroom, what's happening that you don't, that you want to have change, but like bringing your best self to the student of asking like, what can, how can I help you? What can I provide? Uh, I think that helps students think that like you're there to help them and support them rather than telling them like you're doing this wrong or you're doing that wrong. Um, I think that has helped me build more compassion in my classroom. So, And I love the compliment between kind of, well, on my screen, Kayla, Kalia is on one side and Ed is on the other side. So they're literally mirroring and complimenting each other. So Kalia really talking about understanding I think at the last Ed now we're talking about, you know, put your oxygen mask on first before you yeah. take, before Indeed. you actually, exactly. However, there's kind of that you need to focus on yourself, but also center yourself and understand that what you can do, your sphere of control is not the sphere of concern. That's much larger, there's systemic and structural things that are going on, but that doesn't mean if you can't fix those that you can't do anything on your own. On, the, on Ed, you're talking about what then you may need to do for your students in addition. And there's kind of this game of balancing and trying to figure out how we balance some of those things. Rhonda, I know you wanted to get in earlier. Hopefully we haven't gone too far away from the point. No, I just, I, I uh, saw questions around administrators and I wanted to give just a couple of quick tips. Like how can administrators really support teachers in teaching with compassion? And I think uh, one way, how can you lead with compassion? And one way is to really focus on the teacher's learning and to ask the teacher, you know, in a pre-lesson observation, what's the question you're most interested in hearing student responses for? You know, really support the teacher in nurturing the teacher's learning from the students. Um, and also to focus your teachers on, on one part of their practice that they really want to work on. This year, work on listening. Yes, you could work on 10 things in a teacher observation rubric. Let's focus on one row, one box, and two actions that we can move forward. That will carry many other rows. You know, so we're gonna like focus on one thing, really take deliberate action and deliberate practice to move. And um, just to constantly remind everyone in the school that the thing that we're here for is learning. And that's where the joy is. And um, that's where we have our focus. So I think those are the things that administrators can do very easily in the course of their day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rhonda. And thank you all for actually keeping an eye on the Q&A. And like we promised to you and the audience, we're trying to pull out as many of those questions as we can. So we have about two minutes left and I want to give the participants an opportunity to leave you with some thoughts, either some thoughts or some suggestions. So 30 seconds. Anybody wants to go first? No volunteers, any volunteers? All right, Victor. All right, thank you, Uchi. Um, I think uh, one thing I'm reflecting on is that it takes a village and truly it's like, how much can I do to support an individual student versus our entire school community? So um, you know, one thing, and this is credit to Rhonda as part of our teaching team, she's uh, implemented this, this student check-in and student progress report by us naming every single one of our students, you know, going through the list to share what we know about them. So th this also showcases their skills and their strengths and their interests, but also I learned from the relationship that other instructors or educators in the community have with these students. So I think that really centers students and student learning learning in the way we sort of, um, you know, run maybe our professional or administrative meetings. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to go to Rhonda. It's so funny. I was going to say community, Victor. I think that you can't change a community if you're not in the community. So be in the community, be in the community with your students, be in the school community with your other faculty, as well as the local community with the families and businesses and you know, really be in the community. And I think that that will be probably one of the greatest ways to support yourself. 
Great, thank you. And Kalia? So I think in talking about the self-care piece and um, really in alignment with Victor and Rhonda, talking about moving from self-care to community care and looking at like, how are we as a school, as a classroom, you know, thriving, are we thriving and looking at, and this is a different discussion, I think for another time, but looking at formative assessment, not just about academic achievement, but how do I formatively assess where kids are emotionally in my class, right? In the beginning, middle and end of class, not only do you know the answer, mm -hmm. but how do you feel about your knowledge? How do you feel about being here right now in this mm -hmm. space, in this time, given what I just you know, relate to you? Do you feel confident? Do you feel comfortable? Do you feel supported? Um, do you feel like you will get the help that you need? And I think those are the types of formative assessments I would like to see more implemented in classrooms as opposed to how many of you got the answer for number three, right? So just thinking about that, it's a really about the communal care. Brilliant, thank you. Ed. Yeah, I think just kind of echoes what Collier was talking about in terms of just like with the self-care, like you can't do enough yoga like to do. Um, <laughs> fix everything. Um, I think I'm speaking more directly to like, um, like TEP students, like early career teachers that um, as best you can to like form strict firewalls in terms of the amount of time and energy you put towards your classroom. Because if you don't re reinvigorate your own personal life, like with your friends and family and your own physical health, you cannot give more to your students. Um, and so it's a marathon. It's a many decade career process. It is not... Mm -hmm. uh, what's happening tomorrow. And so, um, yeah, taking that personal day if you need it, um, and then making sure that you are reconnecting with your loved ones in your personal life. And that way you can be the best teacher for your classrooms the next day. Ed, Kalia, Rhonda, Victor, I feel so inspired and um, so, much more, so much smarter than I was 30 minutes ago. So thank you all for a fabulous conversation. I hope those of you in the audience got some motivation, got some inspiration, and perhaps you learned some, um, some interesting things and made some, some connections through the questions in the Q&A. So I wanna thank you for joining us in this conversation. You can always stay in touch and check out hgse.me forward slash ednow. If you wanna rewatch any of the past episodes or this episode will also be dropping, you can also go to our Facebook and YouTube channels. Otherwise, take care, stay well, be healthy and talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank Jack. you. Thank Bye, you, everybody. everyone.